Good evening and welcome to our Rain Garden Workshop. We're just going to give everyone a few minutes to um, enter the program here. So we'll get started in just a couple minutes. So sit tight and we'll begin shortly. And seeing lots of folks coming in the program. We're just going to get started in a couple minutes, just giving everyone some time to enter the program. So um, just hang on and we'll, we'll begin in just a moment. Right, so let's get started. Um, so again, welcome to um, everyone who is joining our program. Uh, welcome to Milwaukee Public Library. My name is Kelly Bolter, the programming librarian for the library. And joining me this evening is Lydia, who is our adult services librarian at the Tippy Canoe Branch Library. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Lauren Hayden, Project Manager at Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, otherwise known as MMSD, and Ann O'Connor, uh, Master Gardener with the UW Extension Program. Tonight, they will be sharing all you need to know about planning and planting your rain garden. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, we're gonna have two parts to the presentation uh, this evening. So drop your questions in and we'll have time throughout the program and at the end of the program to um, uh, answer your questions. And with that, I will hand it over to Lauren. All right, thank you so much, Kelly, for that warm introduction and good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, maybe you happened to tune in a few weeks ago to our Climate Resilient Home Workshop. I was there as well with my coworker, Jay Fiker who's another project manager at the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, District. And I'm actually standing in for him tonight. And I'm really excited because in my current role right now, I work for the Private Property Infiltration and Inflow Program. So I'm usually talking to people about foundation drains and their laterals and how to prevent their, or reduce the risk of a basement backup. But prior to coming to MMSD, I actually worked as a natural resource specialist in Minnesota and spent a lot of time with homeowners talking about rain gardens. So this is just a personal passion of mine. So I was really excited when I got asked to do this with the library. So welcome to the rain garden workshop. Again, my name is Lauren Hayden and I'm a project manager at MMSD. I just wanted to give a quick introduction here to the Fresh Coast Center, which is really what's hosting this tonight. And the Fresh Coast Center is operated by the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, really with the goal of working with the community and taking on an active role of protecting our water resources through education, through workshops like this, through tools. We have some resources online in collaboration, partnering with different community groups. And the Fresh Coast Center has been around since about 2017. And they have a great um, team that's really ready to help you at any time. And they have a phone line here at the bottom that you guys can call with any questions you have after this workshop um, about rain barrels or rain gardens um, or the annual plant sale as well, which we'll talk about soon. So tonight we're going to be talking about a few different things. One, we're going to start out with who is the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, which from here on out, for the sake of time, I'm going to call MMSD. And what do we do? Then next, we're going to move over to rain garden planning and install methods. And then I'm going to pass it over to our awesome volunteer master gardener, Ann O'Connor, who's going to talk to you guys about rain garden plants. Definitely the best part of the presentation. And then we're going to wrap it up with other ways that you can be a Fresh Coast Guardian and help protect Lake Michigan. And then spend some time with any questions you guys have. And as Kelly said, please feel free to throw questions in the chat throughout. And I will have, you know, Kelly and other people help moderate them. And we will take a break between my presentation and Anne's to see if there's any questions. So again, I work at the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. 
And really, first and foremost, we are a public health agency, and our mission is to protect public health and the environment through world-class, cost-effective water resource management, leadership, and partnership. And I really, truly believe in that mission statement. It's a wonderful organization to work for, and we really are just constantly pushing the boundary of how we can continue to protect water. So MMSD really has two major roles. The first is water reclamation. You might be familiar with one of our treatment centers down um, town near Jones Island or down in Oak Creek. And these treatment centers receive all of the wastewater that comes from when you flush the toilet, take a shower, do laundry, and all that dirty water goes down through storm drains and eventually gets to these treatment plants to get cleaned and sent back out into Lake Michigan. And that process is called water reclamation. And the next is managing flooding. This is actually a really key service that we provide and have been tasked with. And that includes the management of rivers and creeks. And we do all this to help prevent the risk of flooding in neighborhoods, basement backups, and by working on different green infrastructure projects to remove concrete in rivers and improve flood plans. That's kind of a high level overview of what MMSD does. And who do we serve? We currently serve 1.1 million customers, 28 municipalities who are outlined here on this map and 411 square miles. A lot of people think due to our name, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, that we just serve Milwaukee or Milwaukee County. And that's not true. As you can see here, we serve a portion of Waukesha County here, Ozaki and a little portion of Washington County as well. One thing I want to specify is that we receive all the wastewater from these communities, but we are not the one providing water to these communities. That would be the Milwaukee Water Works. So again, we have some big goals here at MMSD, and one of them is that we help to capture 100% of all the wastewater that comes to us, but right now we've been achieving a 98.5% rate of capturing and cleaning all the dirty water that comes to us. And the reason that we were able to achieve such an awesome number is through the installation of the deep tunnel in 1994. Nationally, the goal set by the EPA is to capture about 85%. And there's honestly a lot of cities similar in size to Milwaukee that are only at 65%. So the fact that we're at 98.5% is amazing. And obviously we'd like to reach a capture and cleaning rate of 100%, but that's kind of where you come in, the homeowners, and we're gonna be talking about that today. So where's all this water coming from and how does it get to us? So we've got a lot of rain, sleet and snow, especially sleet this time of year that falls on Milwaukee each year, about 34 inches. So where does that all go? Well, if we look here on the left, this is an example of more of a natural system where a lot of it, about 50% um, of it, is going to infiltrate naturally into the ground. It's going to soak in and replenish our aquifers. And those aquifers then feed into our, um, our lakes and rivers. And about 40% is going to evapotranspirate and go back into the water cycle. If you remember those awesome um, presentations you made back in elementary school, and this 10% is going to run off. However, when we look at an urban environment like, you know, downtown Milwaukee, where there's 75 to 100% of impervious cover, impervious meaning that water can't penetrate the surface, that ink, that runoff is now increased to 55%, and we only have about 30% of evapotranspiration, so we're really missing out on that water that's normally naturally replenishing those systems. So what is this runoff that we're talking about? Runoff is really anything that is falling onto the surface, especially in pervious surfaces. And it's that kind of horizontal flow that's you know, gravity fed and going downstream until it gets to either a storm basin, a lake or a river. So before all of this development, we had beautiful series of wetlands and natural streams and rivers here in Milwaukee. You see a lot of tributaries. So this is what Milwaukee looked like before development. Um, but unfortunately, as things started to develop, you can see here that we lost a lot of those natural streams and tributaries. The rivers were straightened out, many of them put into pipes or concrete channels. And all these little orange squares that you see in here represent impervious surfaces. So we also lost all of our wetlands 
And if you're familiar with wetlands at all, they really are nature's treatment facility. And by eliminating those wetlands now, we have a responsibility now to figure out how to capture all that excess runoff and find a way to get it safely into our natural systems without impacting homeowners. So how does it get there? It starts off by rain falls down on your roof and your lawn and it flows down until it gets to a catch basin. And this catch basin then sends water into a pipe which eventually outfalls someplace. So whether that again is a stream nearby or a lake and eventually everything here in these Milwaukee watershed is gonna get down to Lake Michigan, which is where we recreate and we play. So we really wanna make sure that this water stays clean. So just remember that for the separate sewer, whatever goes in here in this catch basin ends up here, right at Lake Michigan. And if it's on the ground, that means it's in our water. So think of all the things too that that stormwater is picking up as it's making its way downtown. It's picking up cigarette butts, it's picking up salt, it's picking up fertilizer and it's running over dog poop. It's picking up a lot of different pollutants and it's creating this vessel that goes straight to our lakes and rivers. So in the combined system, we have a little bit of different setup. We now have all that stormwater that we talked about earlier. And now that's also going into the combined sewer system with all the water that you're using in your household that would normally um, be sent out separately. And the combined service area is a pretty small portion of our entire service area. It's approximately one third of Milwaukee and parts of Shorewood. And this service area, the combined service area is where the deep tunnel is located. And really the deep tunnel was designed, sorry, not used to all these transitions yet, this is Jay's. Um, the deep tunnel was designed as a storage solution, not necessarily a pipe for you know, pushing things downstream. So that in these sanitary sewers where we have both the wastewater coming from the house and the stormwater, we have a place to hold it before we pump it back up here right at the end to Jones Island or our South Shore treatment plant. So where else does this water go and how's it moving? Um, throughout the MMSD service area, we have 300 miles of MMSD owned sewers and we have 3000 miles of municipality owned sewers and in this another really important figure, we have 3,000 miles of private laterals. I mentioned before that I work for the Private Property Infiltration and Inflow Program, and we spend a lot of time working with homeowners to improve and replace their laterals because these outdated and leaky laterals, when they're not maintained well, um, add a lot of extra clear water or storm water into our system that then has to be treated. So what are the consequences of all this excess runoff that's coming into our system that we can't necessarily always capture right away? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is flooding, especially in these rivers where we still have concrete channels and we've eliminated those natural floodplains. The water can move very quickly and rise pretty rapidly. The next would be basement backups. Too much water in the system all at once can increase the risk of a basement backup. Um, some things that can increase your risk of a basement backup are connected downspouts or foundation drains that allow that stormwater to enter into your lateral, which is the pipe that carries wastewater from your house to the street. Or also there could just be backups in the municipal sewer where it's backing up into multiple homes at once because it's reached capacity. That's something we hope to prevent. And the last thing here is polluted runoff. So in these urban areas, runoff contains, like I said, different chemicals from cars, it's picking up trash, cigarette butts and yard waste. And if you think of kind of what our streets look like right now, we have some of those slowly fading snow banks and you can see all the pollutants build up on that. So that's the kind of stuff that we're hoping to prevent getting into our lakes and rivers. So what is the solution? Let's focus on the grid part of this. So large scale stormwater management is definitely still part of the answer. Uh, that's something that MMSD takes very seriously. We do a lot of um, projects on revitalizing some of the major rivers in the MMSD service area, like the Kinnikinnick River, Lincoln Creek, and different basins. And these projects are awesome, and they create new recreational space, and they can capture millions and millions of gallons of water. However, they are costly, and they also take up a lot of room. And if you remember that map I showed earlier, 
about 75% of the Milwaukee area is impervious surfaces. And so really the area that we have to work with is a right in our front yard. So that's why the small scale stormwater projects are also key to this success. And that residential green infrastructure really helps keep this polluted runoff from entering our sewers, rivers, and eventually Lake Michigan. So that brings us to rain gardens, why you guys are all here tonight. So I will not delay, let's get straight into it. Let's start with the definition. Rain garden, according to the EPA and me, <laughs> is a depressed area in the landscape that collects rainwater from a roof, a driveway or a street, or even the yard, and allows it to soak into the ground. Some of the benefits of rain gardens is that they help to filter out the pollutants and they also provide great habitat through the use of native plants. They provide food and shelter for our pollinators, our songbirds and other wildlife. So what are the features of a rain garden? What makes it distinct from another type of garden? Well, step one is that it's a shallow depression. We're not looking to make a pond here. We're looking for something that should be able to drain within 48 hours. It's typically a uh, six to 12 inch ponding depth. Don't worry about all the little details on here. This is just a nice visual. The next thing is that it has a flat and level bottom. That's very important too, um, in order for the water to properly infiltrate. And a rain garden is located um, below a source of stormwater runoff, such as a downspout, perhaps your sump pump discharges into your yard, your driveway or your patio or a spot in your lawn where you can kind of intercept that stormwater and where it drains, but without pooling. So that's a really important point is that you never want to put a rain garden at the lowest spot in your yard. It's not going to properly drain and the plants are not going to be happy. You'd be better off just picking plants for that part of your yard that are suited to really moist conditions like some wetland plants. Some things that rain gardens are not, they are not mosquito beds and they're again, not intended to be ponds. So they're not intended to hold water for more than 48 hours. And I also wanted to point this out too, because when I think of rain gardens, I like to think of it in zones. So like I said, you have a flat bottom, but you also have the sides and the edges here which are kind of your inlet and your outlet for the rain garden as well. And later on, when Anne is going to be talking about different plants for your rain garden, this is important to consider because the plants that you put at the bottom of your rain garden are going to get their feet wet a little more than the ones here at their edges. So you're going to want to consider not just the sun versus shade aspects of a plant, but also its moisture tolerance. So how do I install a rain garden? There's kind of four key steps here. The first one we're gonna talk about is selecting location. Then we're gonna talk about design. So the size and shape of your rain garden, which involves not only the area, but also the depth. And then the digging or installation of your rain garden. And lastly, the planting of your rain garden. So location, there are several key points that I wanna point out when you start looking for a spot in your yard to put your rain garden. The first thing I want to mention is that you need to put it near a source of stormwater. So a lot of people, especially in smaller urban lots, um, decide to discharge their downspout directly to their rain garden. It's kind of the easiest thing to do and it's just convenient. And again, you want to make sure that it's about 10 feet away from your house. And this makes sure that that water that's infiltrating and soaking back into the ground is not infiltrating right next to your basement foundation where that water you probably go inside your home. So if a rain garden is properly placed 10 feet away from your home, you don't need to worry about whether or not that water is gonna enter your basement. The next thing is you wanna keep it away from your lateral. If you know approximately where your wastewater pipe is leaving your house, um, I'd encourage you to put your rain garden in a different spot. Again, this just prevents that infiltration from happening right above your lateral, where you could possibly have cracks in it and excess water could get in. You also want to look for as much sun as possible. Most rain garden plants are pretty sun loving. And I think this picture does a great job too of showing that rain gardens can be incorporated into your existing landscaping and really complement it. So clearly these homeowners here had some daylilies and some evergreens and some other perennials in this back here. And then they just simply extended it and built the rain garden right into the landscape. It doesn't need to be standalone. And again, I mentioned no standing water after a rain event. That is a key part. You don't want it to be in that soggy spot in the yard. 
So design sizing. We, one thing that you can use to size your rain garden is you can think about the area that's going to be feeding into it. So if you just pull up Google Maps of your house, um, you can kind of identify the area. Let's see if I can have a tool here. Hopefully you guys can see me. What that's draining here. So let's pretend that your gutter is right here. You're going to want to figure out the square footage of this portion of your roof because that is the water that's going to be feeding into your rain garden. So if you look it up and you use the tools on Google Earth, or you just go outside and you kind of eyeball it, this roof is 15 feet by 35 feet. So we have a square foot square footage of 525 feet. And if you divide by four, that gets you 130 square feet. And that's approximately appropriate size to handle that kind of um, first half inch to one inch rain event, which is what we're looking to capture because that's the most intense part of the rainstorm. And that's also that first flush we consider that's gonna pick up those pollutants and prevent them from going again down the storm drain. The next thing that I wanna encourage people to do specifically, if you know you have clay or compacted soils, is to consider doing an infiltration test. And it's actually pretty simple. You wanna consider digging a hole in the area where you're gonna install your rain garden once you've sited that location. And you're gonna dig a hole that's about the size of a coffee can, so about eight by eight inches, and you're gonna fill it to the top with water. And you're gonna make it all the time, maybe at 6 p.m., Come back the next day at 6 p.m. and note how many inches of water soaked into the ground. So make the rain garden that depth. So for example, if you had six inches soak into the ground in that time, that's the depth you should be. And that's so that you're making sure that the depth of your rain garden can appropriately infiltrate that rain in the first 24 hours. And you also wanna make sure that it's really no deeper than 12 inches. There's very few um, soil types in the area that are gonna properly tolerate that. And more specifically, there's not going to be a lot of plants that will tolerate that. Hey, Lauren, we have yeah. a question from uh, Robert in the Q&A. Uh, Robert wants to know, is there any way to try to estimate some pump, some pump discharge? Ooh, that is a great idea. Um, great question, Robert. That's something I had to do for my job recently. So um, this might involve a little bit of calculations, but um, I, you know what, I can send you more information, but essentially what it comes down to is understanding the volume of the crop of your sump pump. So the average volume that's leaving the crop, and then most manufacturers come with this chart that tells you um, the, the flow rate that's leaving. Um, and so that's something you can usually find, but that's something I actually just calculated for a project because we have several sump pumps that we monitor um, at our projects. And so it's not quite as simple as some of these other things we're talking about, but it's definitely doable. Um, I would say that, you know, if you have a sump pump that's really only running during storm events, you're probably okay to just, um, you know, site it as big as you want. But if you have a sump pump that kind of runs continuously because you have really high groundwater, I would possibly reconsider um, the sizing of it. So I will follow up for sure. All right, um, design. Now we get onto the fun part. So the rain garden design can really be incorporated several ways into your yard. Some people really like to just build it again into their existing landscape. So in this bottom left corner here, this is a great example again of people had some more formal horticultural species and then they just kind of did this lovely little, what I like to call a kidney bean shape and extended that existing garden bed. Pardon me, same here with this one down on the bottom right. I really like the edging that they used here. Um, I would encourage people if possible to use edging. I personally like to use something called a bullet paver. You could just use rocks. I'm not a huge fan of plastic edging because you wanna make sure that the water can leave the rain garden once it's full. But by adding some edging, it just kind of creates a nice visual barrier in your yard of where the rain garden stops and ends. And as these native plants really fill out, you kind of wanna keep them contained. But I really Lauren. emphasize here. Is there another question? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, okay. Kim would like to know what if you have a steep slope where the downspout discharges to? Oh, that is a great question. I thought about including that in here. I have, I could do three presentations on rain gardens, you guys. So there are options. So if you are on a sloped yard, you really have 
two options. The first is that you can build your rain garden flat and berm up the outlet side of it that's facing the street so that you can kind of hold that water in there. And then you're going to kind of want to create a notch in that berm so that, you know, at one point the water can flow out of it. The second is that there's a lot of great examples of rain gardens where the back part of it where the inlet is, is more of a retaining wall. So you can actually dig down a little bit, like six inches, put some brick or some, you know, larger river rock there. And then that would be the back of your rain garden. I usually encourage putting some landscaping fabric behind that to kind of prevent any erosion. But one guide that I wanted to mention earlier was that the Wisconsin DNR has, for anyone who really likes, has a more complicated rain garden layout or is like me and likes to get kind of nerdy about this, they have a fantastic guide that is super detailed and gets into all those factors in regards to putting in possibly a retaining wall, what to do if your rain garden is on a slope, how to create the berm, proper sizing, all of those details are in there. It's a wonderful booklet and it's for free online. If you just Google DNR rain garden, it'll probably be the first link that pops up. All right here. So I wanna make sure we have time for plants. So I'll try to keep going here. Um, I really wanna emphasize here that anything is better than nothing. Some of you might be saying, Lauren, I just, I really don't wanna get on my calculator just to garden and that's totally okay. Um, all these yards, these before pictures are great examples of where people had very minimal landscaping or something that was very low maintenance. And then they just added something like a little five by five garden here at the bottom. And that created extra habitat in their yard. And it also created an area for their downspout to discharge where again, that water can kind of infiltrate into the yard. And so it really doesn't have to be big or spectacular. And I also wanna emphasize that as well because maintenance is an important aspect of this. A lot of people will tell you that rain gardens are no maintenance and that's not true. They're definitely low maintenance, but if you're currently you know, having a hard time maintaining your existing landscaping, maybe start out small and then continue to add onto it. Because you want to make sure that it's enjoyable for you. You want to be something that you can look out and you're happy with and not just, you know, kind of groan and be like, oh, I have to come maintain my rain garden. So before you get to the installation, I need to put out a quick disclaimer that you need to make sure you call your diggers hotline. So you just call 811 or visit diggershotline.com. And you also want to make sure you're checking for your own private utilities, like any electric lines or irrigation, you might be responsible for reporting that. So I wanna show a quick time-lapse video here. And I really like this video because one, it emphasizes, this is kind of just a standard size rain garden and this yard, you know, this is actually in Minneapolis, but it's similar to Milwaukee in that they're not very big front yards. And this shows that this really is something that you can just do in an afternoon. It certainly helps to have friends like they're in this video. But I'm gonna kind of narrate as this video goes on here. So let's see. All right, starting at the very beginning here, they've laid out their rain garden. They use spray paint to kind of demark it. You could literally just use a hose as well. It's as formal as you want it to be. And they started to cut away the sod. They're just using a sod kicker, a manual one. You could also use a shuffle or you can even rent a sod kicker from the store. The next thing that they're gonna do is they're starting to dig down into their basin. You'll notice that they're leaving about a foot around the edge where they're not digging down into the basement, or sorry, into the basin. And this is important because you want a really gradual slope into your rain garden. We usually consider it a three to one slope. So for example, your rain garden is six inches in, in depth. Um, you know, you'd want a foot, about a foot and a half of slowly grading down there. You don't want it to have sharp edges like a swimming pool. So they've dug that down and now they're starting to slope the edges of the rain garden. They've loosened the soil in the middle to help improve the infiltration. And you can see that they're taking some of that soil away in their wheelbarrows, possibly using it in another project around the house. Now their rain garden was all nicely sloped. The basin was flat. The next step that they're gonna do is mulch. And you might say, Lauren, why would you mulch first? And the reason you would mulch first is because it actually helps prevent the compaction of the soil. You just spent a lot of time and sweat and energy loosening up that soil, maybe mixing in some compost or sand to improve root infiltration. And you don't want to compact it all with people stepping on it. So then the people are going to come out here. And the next thing you want to do is I encourage you to lay out your plants and have it all kind of laid out 
before you start planting. Then get a buddy and start planting. You know, loosen up those roots, make sure you're not creating any mulch volcanoes around those plants. Again, you see that they're doing it probably a foot to 18 inches on the center. You really don't need to put them that close. And another thing I like in this video is you can see that they're kind of grouping the plants together. Anne's gonna get into that more of the actual design aspects, but visually you can already tell that it's easy to see which species are where. And they're putting in their inlet there. They created just a little bit of a notch. This person decided to put down some landscaping fabric and rock. This is how we armor the inlet so that the velocity of the water coming in doesn't immediately blow your mulch all over the place. I'm really a fan of that. And lastly, you're just gonna water it. And there's your rain garden. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide here. Come on, there we go. Okay. So again, there are a lot of great resources out there and I can't really get into all the nitty gritties of this, but essentially the main steps to a rain garden, again, you're gonna outline the shape of your rain garden using string or spray paint. You're gonna remove the sod. There are methods of doing other site prep, but generally I'd say for any rain garden that's below 200 square feet, you can just remove the sod. You could do things like um, sheet mulching or solarizing to kill the turf, but I would stick that stick with those methods for larger garden beds. Then you're gonna again, dig down based on the results of the infiltration test. So if your infiltration test said you should do six inches, dig down about six inches, make sure the edges are sloped again, about a three to one ratio. When you're done, use a board and level to ensure the base of your garden is flat, or you could use a string and a level. And if you have really compacted soils or clay soils, I would encourage you to mix in about one to two inches of a leaf litter compost. That's something you can get from most garden centers or sand to improve the infiltration. And then lastly, identify your inlet and your outlet. If you're on a pretty flat surface, you don't need to worry so much about it. an outlet. The water will naturally fill up and then leave if the storm continues. Um, I would say that if you're on a sloped surface, a sloped surface and you're berming it up, it's more important to identify the outlet. And it doesn't even have to be a notch. You just wanna make sure that your berm elevation is lower than the inlet. So some quick tips about planting. Um, again, you wanna mulch first to reduce that soil compaction. I encourage using a double shredded hardwood mulch, about three inches of it. You wanna lay it down pretty thick. Um, avoid free mulch. It's a tempting, but it often comes also with free weed seeds, which I'm sure you don't wanna be pulling out of your garden. And lay out your garden before planting to ensure proper spacing. I suggest a foot to a foot and a half apart for grasses and flowers and shrubs about three to four feet apart and avoid those mulch volcanoes. Give your plant room to breathe. This is an example of some plugs that were planted from our rain garden sale just after a few weeks and just after one year. So even though they seem very tiny, these native plants establish very quickly and will grow and fill in nicely. And I do wanna mention again that, that maintenance is lower. For that first year, I would encourage that you try to water those plugs. And then after that, you really shouldn't need to. And then I stick with the encouragement of weeding, try to weed three times a year. Think of the three summer holidays, Memorial Day, 4th of July, and Labor Day. And then in the fall, just focus on cleaning out the inlet and any debris that's filled into your rain garden. So again, right, I'm gonna have Anne talk about all the awesome plants, but we do have a rain garden plant sale coming up. Orders are due April 12th, and the pickup will be June 11th. Anne's gonna show you guys the website later and what to look for on there, but we are still accepting orders. So after this presentation, go online and order some plants. All right, so I'm gonna pass this over now to Anne, our volunteer master gardener to talk about plant selection and design. And I'm gonna stop sharing here. Thank you, Lauren, that was fabulous. And um, I would just like to say that if anyone has the opportunity to tour MMSD, um, my garden club did that recently and you will learn a lot of the things that Lauren talked about here and it's really fascinating. And there's probably something coming up on a doors open, I would guess, but it's really wonderful. So um, I'm now going to open up my presentation and um, we as master gardeners learn that we are not meant to be walking encyclopedias, but able to resource and find answers to questions. 
So um, I want to let you know that if some of your questions aren't answered during the course of the presentation and you want to get a hold of me through the library, you can email them and have them pass along a question to me and I will do the research for you. And additionally, it seems like our audience is pretty knowledgeable. I saw a note from Maria mentioning that she caught a five gallon bucket of stormwater today just out of one downspout. And so, yes, that's important to realize how much is displaced by your roof. And that's why we are talking about rain gardens here today. Um, I, I've also had the opportunity to work with some of the folks that you saw pictured in Lauren's presentation, helping to install rain barrels and rain gardens um, through seven or eight different municipalities in the uh, MMSD service district. And um, one thing you realize is how quickly those rain barrels will fill up. And so a rain garden is a wonderful way to contain that stormwater on site for a little bit longer. Um, so now I'm going to pull up my uh, presentation here. One moment, please. There we go. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the plants here. And uh, like Lauren, I have also inherited my presentation from some other people who have gone before me. Um, Jennifer Lazuski has adapted this as well as Mary Volker and Sharon Morrissey as a contributor. So I wanna acknowledge them. I love this picture. Um, so this shows why, why native plants work so well. On the left here is our traditional um, turf grass, Kentucky bluegrass, which- Hey, Anne, I'm just gonna pause real quick. You're not sharing your screen quite yet. Oh, shoot, okay. <laughs> okay. Let me close this out. Here we go. There, there can you go. see it now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you perfect. Now. So now, now you will see why I like this picture so much. Um, this is showing you the root structures of native plants and why they help so significantly um, in infiltration of stormwater. And this here on the far left is traditional Kentucky bluegrass that comprises most of our lawns. And you can see how incredibly shallow that roof surface is. So the, the good news is that when you're peeling this back to make your rain garden, you, you only have about a shovel step to peel back there. Um, and then some of these other plants are available in the plant sale, and I will cover them briefly in my presentation. Um, but for example, this is the lead plant and look how deep the, that root structure goes. They're showing this down here um, to a depth of, uh, the numbers are a little hard to read, but I think that's about 14 feet. Um, that's definitely something that's available as is a variety of goldenrod. Um, this is, this is one of the bone set right here. So it's just a wonderful way to see how hard these native plants work for us in terms of managing stormwater. Uh, one of our mantras in the, man in the Master Gardener program is right plant, right place. So you're gonna make your job a lot easier if you're not struggling um, with your conditions. Um, but congratulations, anyone interested in native plants is already doing the right thing by appropriately matching um, vegetation for our climate. So you're not struggling to grow a, a tropical orchid or something in, in, the, in a Midwest prairie setting. So um, here we're talking about seasonal sunlight, which is something that you might wanna observe um, if you haven't already in your own yard, once the leaves are on the trees, because were we so lucky to see the sun these days, um, most of us were getting full sunlight for the full time as trees have not leaved out yet. So full sun is considered more than uh, six hours a day. Part sun is about um, three to six, and then shade is anything less than that. So um, try to observe where you're gonna be planting your rain garden and what your, your sun conditions are as well. But we do have um, plants available that we can recommend for any sort of condition. I know that was one of the questions someone dropped into the chat. And yes, for part shade and shade, there are options and some of those are available in the plant sale as well. 
The other consideration is the type of soil that you have, whether it's sandy, loamy, or clay. And in Southeast Wisconsin, clay is definitely the predominantly soil type. Um, so Lauren talked a little bit about the coffee can test and uh, watching your infiltration. That will tell you a little bit about if your conditions are dry and well-drained or medium, which means moist, but not wet. Um, if it's wet, that means there's water standing in the spring. And then if you have a ponding situation, that water is gonna hang around for even longer. And those last two are not typically your ideal place for a rain garden. That's when you wanna go with those wetland plants instead. We're not um, encouraging more water to stand in a place if it's already standing, because you do want your rain garden to dry up, to dry up um, within 24 to 48 hours. Here's the planning. So point of view, um, if you got, have something that's sort of up around the house, you may wish to put your taller plants at the back, medium in the middle and shorter at the front. Um, if you have a standalone bed, you can do the tallest in the middle and then around the edges. And again, we're gonna to wanna to take those wet feet into consideration um, your sun conditions. Um, I have a garden outside my back door, a rain garden, and I personally sited it so that I can see it from inside my house. I have a glass door at the back. So my favorite vantage point is maybe reverse. So I'm looking from the inside out and that's the way that I wanted it to work for me. Um, in terms of appearance, neat or natural, typically you're gonna have a more manicured or neat look if you go with less types of plant material and clump those plant types um, together. If you wanna mix it up a little bit, that's gonna give you a more natural appearance. And if you wanna go with a larger variety of plants, that might give you a more natural appearance as well. You wanna consider things like height of each plant, um, the size, the texture, and not only of, of the blooms, but of the foliage. I'm a big foliage person. So I'll point out a few things that I find um, particularly attractive. And then um, you also wanna consider seasons. So as we all are aware right now, also winter and spring are long seasons here. So I like things that have winter interest as well. Some of the grasses and the sedges that will remain throughout the winter um, an advantage to, in addition to the advantage of the aesthetics of that, it also provides habitat. It um, allows winters to, our animals in winter to possibly shelter there. It might be a source of food. Um, it harbors insects that are beneficial. So lots of things to consider when you are um, looking at your design. And then typically they say in the design world, groups of five to seven, plants um, work really well. Odd numbers. If you've ever designed a floral bouquet or a container, um, one of the things we also learned was thriller, spiller, and filler. So a thriller is maybe your taller, more dramatic plant. Um, spiller is something that has a legier uh, growing habit, and then a filler, something that's a little more consistent and might spread more. So some of the things that we'll look at are different grasses and sedges. Um, like I said, we wanna consider color and bloom time, something to look at for all the seasons, and then what sort of flowers, foliage, and fruit each plant offers. So in this particular picture, you can see there are a variety of textures and shapes and colors. So here we have the yell that's a little bit more feathery, and then we have spiky, um, green in the front with the round uh, flower shape. And I just kind of like the way that, and then this is a little bit weepier and droopy. So all these different textures of foliage and the blooms themselves, um, as well the textures and colors really work well together. Maintenance. So while longer term native plants are less maintenance, you definitely want to work on your garden early on to allow things to get established. So you don't want that your new plants to have to compete with weeds that are gonna fight with them for that, um, the nutrients and the water. So you definitely wanna keep it well weeded. The mulch that you put down will help. 
um, suppress some of that weed growth, but you do wanna check it for weeds. Um, and you will need to water um, periodically after installation, uh, especially if, you're, if we're experiencing drier conditions. So once it gets to summer, you wanna keep it well, well watered at least for the first year. And then this is probably a good opportunity to mention rabbits and possibly deer. So especially that new growth when you install um, can be particularly tempting and tasty for, for some of our animal friends. So you might wanna put some protection around your new plant growth. Um, if we were doing this in live and in person, we were available to help you with your design. But like I said, if you wanna reach out and send questions through the library, um, I can be available that way. Here's an example of um, drawing it on paper before you go out and spray paint your, your turf or wherever you're going to install your rain garden. And don't get too bogged down. This is pretty detailed, but I guess the general idea that you wanna take away is trying to get a variety of bloom time, trying to get a variety of foliage and heights. and pocket gardens. So luckily, um, some of the work has already been done for us in some garden compilations, which we'll look at shortly. So I, I'll go back to this when we um, navigate over to the MMSD plant sale website because they put together some packages that sort of take a little bit of the guesswork out of it. But some favorites um, in terms of supporting pollinators and um, we'll go over these icons real quickly. So this indicates that the plant material is attractive to birds. This means it is pollinator friendly for butterflies as well and other uh, pollinators. The scissors shows that you can um, cut the bloom for a, a cutting garden. And this means that it is suitable for a rain garden. And you'll see all these icons again when we go to the plant sale page. Here's a wild bergamo, um, otherwise known as Monarda. This is a nice choice. It will grow two to four feet tall, pale purple to pink, and its bloom time is July to August. Uh, bone set, this is actually one of my favorites. It has some really nice structure. Um, I like the white color, uh, three to four feet tall and bloom sort of mid, mid summer to early fall. The great blue lobelia has a really pretty um, blue purple flower. And this is a shorter thing. So you could put this um, around the edges or at the front of your garden. And this will bloom same time as um, Menarda July through September. And then the cardinal flower is especially attractive to uh, birds and hummingbirds. I will say, I, I know several people who are very good gardeners and this has been a challenging plant for them, but it is definitely worth it if you can get that bright red color introduced into your garden. And then sedges and grasses can provide some really nice structure. Um, they can also help support some of the flowers around them. And this is a good one that's suitable for rain gardens. Um, I won't spend too much time on that list. So let's navigate over to the plant sale website. Oh, I am gonna show you um, in terms of further resources. Here is also um, the learning store, which is part of Division of Extension University of Wisconsin-Madison, which um, is the host of the Master Gardener program. There are all kinds of different free um, lawn and garden pamphlets and downloads here. So ignore where it says sold out. Um, you can download most of these. And here we go over to the plant sale. So this is the um, welcoming page that you will see. Wildflowers and legumes are in one category. And then grasses and sedges are another, but here's the garden kits that I'd like to show you. So someone had asked about part sun to shade. So let's go here. So this is called the dappled sun downspout pocket garden, part sun to full shade. 
um, and your soil conditions there would be wet mesic to dry mesic. So that's pretty suitable for a lot of different situations. And here you'll be provided with six different varieties, um, two uh, of the grass and sedge category, and these of the other uh, wildflowers. But you can see you get this nice mix of heights, of textures, of foliage. Um, I think I mentioned penstemon is one of my favorites for the foliage also. It's um, a very deep green, almost sort of leathery in, in appearance. Um, but this is kind of nice because they're, they've taken the guesswork out of it. So I know we wanted to leave some time for questions and I think Lauren had some closing remarks as well. So I'm just gonna um, go back to one, one more area here and then I'll pass it back to Lauren. Oops. So here's the um, Shady Spring Pollinator Pocket. This is a fun one to think about um, coming up. Here, here we've got uh, five different varieties. And again, a very nice mix of heights, of color. Um, but this one is more concentrated in, into spring. But this is a good one for um, if you are working with shadier conditions, more mature trees. And I know in a lot of areas too, we are working with um, a lot of mature trees. So this might be suitable um, for a lot of our suburban locations as well. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna hand it back to Lauren. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing, Lauren. Um, if, if people would like to visit some rain gardens um, to get an idea of what they look like in different seasons, um, I'd like to recommend two different sites. Um, I'm also co-president of the Whitefish Bay Garden Club and two of our members um, received funding from um, Fun for Lake Michigan and MMSD to put in a bioswale and a rain garden, as well as additional native plants at Silver Spring Park. And our club worked with Merrick Landscaping and Johnson Nursery to install that. And there's some very nice signage next to each plant. So it's a great educational opportunity because you can see how these function um, in a park setting. And if you visit more than once, you can see how they look throughout the seasons. And then Lakeshore State Park, which is actually built on the infill or that was dredged from the lake for the deep tunnel project is another great place where there's some um, native plant demonstration gardens. So that's a wonderful way to go see how these plants look throughout the year. One back here. I completely agree with what Ann said about visiting gardens year long. Um, you really get a good sense of seasonal interest what you like, what you don't like. Some of them might have beautiful blooms at the beginning and you might not like the way they dry out. I tend to like that, so highly encourage that. Kelly, I believe you mentioned during our last workshop too that the Tippecanoe Library has some demonstration gardens as well, is that correct? Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Lauren. Um, so the Tippecanoe Branch Library uh, has a butterfly garden that was just put in last year. So um, I think this year the, the, with the adage about perennials is the first year they sleep and the second year they creep. Um, so we'll be in the second year. Um, they were already bursting um, at the end of summer last year. So, um, so yeah, I encourage everyone to um, stop by the branch and take a look. Um, it is right outside the entrance to the Seeker Garden. So if you don't know where that is, if you stop inside, ask any of the friendly librarians or um, library staff there um, where that is, and they'd be happy to show you. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to take us home, and then we'll have lots of, hopefully, some time for questions, too. So I just want to quick highlight some other ways that you can be a Fresh Coast Guardian, and really, that just means some other ways that you can continue to care for Lake Michigan and highlight some other programs we have at MMSD. The first one would be to install a rain barrel. Sadly, this is not a rain barrel workshop, but a pro tip. At the very end, when I list the newsletter, I encourage you to sign up because we will be having rain barrel workshops in the future. 
Um, Jay is kind of our resident rain barrel guru. He knows everything. He's installed hundreds. And a lot of times at our rain barrel workshops, they will specify whether or not you would be eligible for getting a rain garden rain barrel at the end. Sadly, right now we're experiencing some supply issues. Um, I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing that, but um, we're currently not selling rain barrels outside of our office like we normally are. But a rain barrel, to get back to the point, is a great way to capture kind of that first flush again. Obviously, it's not going to capture everything that comes out of your roof. The rain barrels that we specifically sell have a diverter kit. You'll see right here where it attaches to the downspout. So that means that once this rain barrel is full, it's usually like a 50 gallon rain barrel. The water goes back in, so it's not going to be overflowing over the top. And this is just a great way to water some of the plants in your yard. The next thing is the water drop alert. If you have your phone on you right now, I encourage you to do this. I have the water drop alert as well. And I promise you, you only get them when absolutely necessary and it's one text. And the purpose of the water drop alert is to help people use less water during heavy rain events. And we talked about earlier that in a lot of our systems, we have excess storm water entering into the system. And when suddenly we have all that storm water in the system and then we add washing dishes and doing laundry and taking a short, you know, taking showers, it can really overwhelm the system. So it's really only during very intense rain events where we possibly anticipate, um, you know, needing to open up the deep tunnel. So if you just text water drop to that number at the bottom, it'll sign you up and then it'll tell you that a water drop alert is on and then it'll tell you when it's off. So it's always a great excuse to push off the laundry one more day. The next thing is the home hazmat collection. We actually now have a year round facility in Waukee and Menominee Falls where people can drop it off. It's no longer just a you know quarterly thing that we do. So that's a really great resource for the community. Um, if you go to our website, um, we just redid it. But even if you just go to the MMSG.com, what you can do, you'll be able to find the hazmat collection and it'll tell you everything that you can drop off. And it is free for Milwaukee County residents. And the next is the what's your why? We like to ask people this if, um, because we really wanna know what inspires you when it comes to water. Why do you love Lake Michigan and wanna protect it? And to incentivize that, if you send us a photo and tell us what is your why, why you know, protecting water is important to you, we will send you one of these cool Fresh Coast t-shirts. It really doesn't show the front here very well, but everyone in our office fights over them. Um, my husband stole mine and they're very comfortable and people, it's a good conversation starter when you're walking around. All right, so that really sums it up, but the next thing would just be to follow us on social media so that you can hear about the plant sale, you can hear about upcoming workshops and events that we'll be at. And I mentioned that pro tip before about rain barrels. I would highly encourage you to join our newsletter. I believe they send it out about monthly. I'm not quite sure. Again, I'm a, I'm a stand-in Fresh Coast Guardian today. So you just go to freshcoastguardians.com and you'll be able to find the link for the newsletter there. So again, the Fresh Coast Guardians is a, you know, a group from MMSD and they're the, really the ones that are engaging with the public and offering these direct resources to you. So that concludes our rain garden workshop. I know we went over a lot of materials. So I think we have maybe just a few minutes to answer questions. Kelly, are there any coming through in the chat that you yeah, we've got um, yeah quite a few questions here. So one quick one, um, we had a question earlier from someone wondering um, where to get those yard signs. I know we saw them in a few of the pictures. Yeah, I thought I answered. So um, I believe, so in the past we've done more, my coworker Jay was in charge of doing a lot of our neighborhood outreach where we were doing a lot of rain garden installs and I know that's where those went on, but I believe we probably have a backstock someplace. So if someone had a rain garden, I would again encourage you to go to Fresh Coast Guardians and there's a place where you can submit a question. And there's also a phone line that you can call at any time and leave a message. And if we have signs, I'm sure Jay would love to get one to you. And Jay, if that's not true, I'll take responsibility for it. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Um, and we, uh, with the library will send out an email in a few days with the recording. Um, and then we can share um, that contact information to for MMSD. So you'll hop that in your email. Um, I've got two questions um, for Anne. There is a question from Tracy. Uh, what type of protection against bunnies would you recommend? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> 
Um, so if you want to put up a physical barrier, um, that would work very well. Some uh, chicken coop wire and fence off the area. Additionally, you can go to your local garden center um, and there are environmentally friendly uh, products like liquid fence. Um, those will have to be reapplied after a rain event. Um, and you might not like the, the smell. It, uh, that's also meant to uh, keep rabbits away. Um, but I definitely recommend trying to protect that new growth if you can. All right, thank you. And then here's a question from Dan. Um, I have a few pine trees on my property and I read that pine trees and pine needles will impact the pH of soil. Are there any flowers to buy for this type of pH sensitive soil? Dan, I was just looking that up for you um, because I don't know that off the top of my head. And I know that I myself garden under a very light, large pine tree and it has not negatively affected that. Um, but Lauren, are you aware um, with your plant knowledge? Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, this, this I promise this isn't a cop on answer, but what I like to do too is one, um, I like to get into nature because nature has pine trees and nature will tell you what's growing really well under there. I did list some native plants before a lot of those plants would probably do pretty well under pines. I've successfully planted things like pen sedge, wild geranium, bloodroot, Canada anemone. Um, those plants are pretty tolerant of a lot of different conditions and they are intended to be like shaded species. So I would say you'd have some success there. I was also trying to look up the, the pH question because I had heard that that was not actually true, that there wasn't enough acidity to be affected. But, um, I can't find that right now definitively. So I'm gonna continue looking. Okay. I did see a question from mm -hmm. Sharon about, can I order from the MMSD plant sale if I live in New Berlin? Yes, of course. Anybody can order from the MMSD plant sale. It is open to not only our entire service area, but if you live you know, out in Waukesha, you're welcome to order too. It's just a matter of convenience. Will the PowerPoint be shared with attendees? Is that going to be something that we can send out with our email? Yeah, I think that's I think that's reasonable. I will send I will send you again the the PDF slides. That way, it's not too big. Um, but yes, then all those resources will be on there. Okay. Yeah, and for any um, questions that you might have tonight, um, if you're attending and maybe think of later, um, you can email the library at MPL webinars at milwaukee.gov um, and we'd be happy to pass your questions or comments along to Lauren and Ann. Um, so, so you don't have to feel like you've got to get everything in tonight. Um, we are happy to share those with them. A uh, comment from Irina um, about the um, uh, pine tree question. My day lilies work very well with the pines that we have. So um, nice tip there. Let's see. Um, Question from Heather. My sub pump output is a metal pipe. Any advice to create an inlet with, with damage or without damaging the connection to the house? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, a lot of them do just, I'm picturing that you just kind of have this vertical or horizontal pipe just kind of sticking out there. Um, you know, there's different attachments. You see a lot of people have that kind of small, like two inch corrugated piping that you could attach with just like a hose clamp or something like that. And that would be a way to extend the sump pump discharge away from the house, just like you want your downspouts to be extended. You also want your sump pump discharge to be extended to make sure that that's not immediately pooling around your foundation. Not necessarily 10 feet, as long as you have a significant, you know, slight slope away from your foundation. And I think Anne, you answered it. But yep. the thing about milkweed, but every milkweed is great for butterflies. <laughs> yeah, and again, the email for um, any questions that you may have, mplwebinars at milwaukee.gov, and we'll pass those along to Lauren and Diane. I do, I, I'm sorry, I just am guilty. I worked in Minnesota for the first you know, six years of my career, so I got to put a plug in, but it applies to Wisconsin too. 
there's a great tool. It's called, you go to bluethumb.com. Think of having a green thumb, but it's a blue thumb because it's about planting for clean water. And they have the plant finder tool that I have found to be the most user-friendly. And really you can just go and select your moist. If you know your moisture conditions or your sun conditions, and it will pull from a database and pull a bunch of pictures and resources similar to our plant sale um, of all the different native plants that would be suitable for your site. I still reference it myself. Um, I'll quick fill that in the chat, but that's a resource that I always mention to people. And we're in a close enough growing range that most of the species you're gonna see on there are gonna be totally appropriate for Milwaukee. A question from Angelina. I have two neighbors draining their gutter in, into my yard. It makes my yard a flooded mess. Any advice? That's hard. I'm sorry, Angelina. Um, one, if you're comfortable talking to them, um, you know, you could let them know that, you know, during those storm events that water is pooling in your yard and you'd really like to find a solution. Um, so maybe you guys could put a garden in between your yard. Maybe you can encourage them to get a rain barrel. Definitely if the water is being discharged where it's going to be within 10 feet of your basement, I would definitely let them know that that's, you know, putting you at risk of water getting into your basement. Um, I live in Wauwatosa where I can practically reach out my windows and touch my neighbors. So I totally understand that it can be really difficult to find the proper spacing to discharge water into your yard. So you definitely had to have good communication and be a little bit creative when it comes to things like that. And I see that Kim put in a link to the DNR stormwater rain garden manual, which is awesome. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, again, I love to talk about this stuff. Please feel free to reach out, reach out through the Fresh Coast Center, reach out through Kelly, your question will get to us and we'd be happy to answer it anytime. Right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you everyone for sharing your night with us. This was fun. Thank you so much, Anne and Lauren. Uh, we loved uh, hearing your expertise and getting such a well-rounded view of like what rain gardens are and how you know that contributes to our uh, water management system and um, in the service area. Um, so again, if you have any questions that haven't been answered tonight, just shoot an email um, to mplwebinars at milwaukee.gov. Um, in a few days, we will send out an email with a link to the recording um, of tonight's presentation, and um, we'll be able to share out the PDF of the slides with you, and then also some helpful links as well. Um, and uh, we just appreciate all of your questions tonight. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us. And uh, be sure to check out um, more coming events from Milwaukee Public Library at mpl.org. We have a climate change page that lists all of the green sustainability programs that we have um, currently coming up over the next few months. So thank you again for joining us. And thanks again to Anna and Lauren. We really appreciated it and had such a, a wonderful and fascinating evening with you. So have a great evening, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Kelly.